I am delighted to be here for the talk from my colleague, the Reverend Dr. Christine Sunakuro, who is an Associate Professor of Theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. She is a Latvian American theologian, and she works at the intersection of post-colonialism, liturgical and sacramental studies, as well as migration and diasporic studies. She currently serves as the convener of the Critical Theories and Liturgical Studies Seminar at the North American Academy of Liturgy. And as a Lutheran pastor, she has served the diasporic Latvian Lutheran communities in Great Britain, Germany, and the United States. Her most recent book is called In Counterpoint, Diaspora, Postcoloniality, and Sacramental Theology and she has also authored numerous book chapters and articles. One colleague praises her recent book saying, Christine Sunakoro does phenomenal work reading the sacraments through post-colonial lenses, grounded in expansive post-colonial theory and solid sacramental theology, Sunakura shows how the theological imagination, when done from a diasporic place, can challenge and expand the ways we think about God. Echoing Aidan Kavanaugh by way of the Baltic Sea, Suna Koro issues a call for us to consider sacramental theology as theologia prima. So maybe some concepts and names in there that our foundation students will recognize. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Suna Koro as she comes to speak to us about sacraments and post-colonial planetarity reimagining the sacramental signature of all things in the era of environmental degradation. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for such a warm introduction. And tonight it's going to be an accent fest because as you can hear, I'm also off the boat or, or off the plane uh, to be more exact. Um, I am delighted to be here uh, every and any time when there is somebody who is interested in having a conversation about sacraments. It's just an absolute pleasure. So. Uh, no matter what, uh, when the invitation came, I immediately said yes. And indeed, uh, it's been quite an interesting day. I came from Cincinnati where we are having almost a tropical summer and now we are here and I even got to enjoy some fall colors, which was wonderful. So here we are. Uh, tonight, I'm going to just share a few remarks, a few thoughts about sacramental theology, uh, some major issues, some major questions uh, in light of post-colonial discourse. And as far as our interpreters, both Sarah's are concerned, I already apologized in advance. There will be some words that are quite a mouthful. And uh, <laughs> that is just what happens when you engage in post-colonial work because I don't know for what reason, but uh, the language sometimes is quite forbidding. We live in interesting times. A sense of multiple overlapping crises soaks the monotony of daily life. The crises of democracy, the crises of migration, of poverty and injustice, the crises of addictions, and the ongoing collateral damage of globalization, to name just a few. Quite a few people in more than one continent are deeply concerned about the late postmodern forays into neo-fascism, religious extremism, racism, and socio-cultural tribalism. Here in North America, retired generals call us to appraise the far-reaching jeopardies presented by the so-called Age of Lies, if you read uh, General Hayden's uh, latest book, while philosophers appeal to our courage to delve into the origins of the monarchy of fear with Martha Nussbaum. Yet there's one creeping crisis that looms larger, broader, and deeper than all the other exigencies, and it aggravates them all. It concerns, as Elizabeth Johnson puts it, our planet in peril. It involves the advancing ecological devastation of the Earth. But not, not only that, along with climate change, as Christian Parenti observes, 
the global tropic of chaos is arriving that already engenders a whole new geography of violence. Ecological degradation is not an external crisis for Christians and Christianity that could be singularly and easily blamed on secularism, capitalism, socialism, mafia, deep state, even the devil, you name it. As all those familiar with eco-theological thought will surely remember, already a few generations ago, a few decades ago before I was born, um, the generation uh, that experienced the first inklings of this crisis was already recognized by the historian Len White when he raised the uncomfortable idea that Christian anthropocentrism and belief in human dominion over the rest of the creation has something to do with this state of affairs in his influential essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crises. At the turn of the century, Thomas Berry, expressed an even more uncomfortable idea that the four institutional formations most culpable for the unsustainable way of life are not limited to some hegemonic governments and corporations alone, but also include organized religion and universities. In this context, it is truly interesting to observe that some of the most notable post-colonial interventions into the ecological degradation discourse have recently come from thinkers who ordinarily would not be overly eager to engage theology and theologians at all on any question. As I have written elsewhere, it is no secret that most post-colonial scholars have been very reticent to engage theology, let alone its sacramental and liturgical modalities. Yet recently, for example, the post-colonial historian Dipesh Chakrabarti has hailed Pope Francis and his encyclical Laudato Si as a pivotal resource for advocating a much needed shift away from the entrenched modern Western dichotomy between nature and culture. Chakrabarti praises Francis for emphasizing, and I quote, that human justice should be extended not just to animals that cross a certain threshold of sentience, but to the entire world of natural reproductive life, what Aristotle called the Zoe. Chakrabarti turns to theological voices to augment the contribution of humanities to dislodge the inadequate, I quote, single-minded focus on human welfare and intrahuman justice which has, up until very recently, also dominated post-colonial critiques. It is clear now that the deeply set human centrism of post-colonial thought must be speedily overcome. Visions of eco-justice such as Laudato Si can, Chakrabarti implies, help post-colonial humanities, and I quote again, learn to have recourse to forms of thought that go beyond but that do not discard the human political dimension of critique and creativity. Another prominent post-colonial voice agrees. The acclaimed writer Amitav Ghosh also sees the vision of eco-theology and eco-justice expressed in Francis's Laudato Si as one of the most significant loci of hope in the present time that he calls very eloquently the great derangement. Gosh salutes Francis' critique of the technocratic paradigm and the intrinsic conjoining of the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Gosh is more optimistic, uh, I have to say quite surprisingly for a post-colonial thinker, about the role of organized religious communities in mitigating this devastation in progress. Why? Well, he argues that, and I will quote, those with religious affiliations possess the ability to mobilize people in far greater numbers than any others. So organization counts. Moreover, religious worldviews are not subject to the limitations that have made climate change such a challenge for our existing institutions of governance. They transcend nation states and all acknowledge intergenerational long-term responsibilities. They do not partake of economistic ways of thinking and are therefore capable of imagining non-linear change. Catastrophe, he says, in other words. 
From a theological angle, one might wonder what it is that makes the eco-theological vision such as set out in the Laudato Si so hopeful and inspirational for post-colonial modes of thought. I submit, and that's just my two cents, that it is the radically incarnational, albeit somewhat methodologically understated, sacramental Im imaginary. It comes as no surprise, given that the author of Laudato Si is steeped in Ignatian spirituality, which at its core is intrinsically and holistically sacramental. Francis sums it up in such a nuanced way by stating that the universe unfolds in God, hence there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dewdrop, in a poor person's face. That the ideal is not only to pass from the exterior to the interior, he writes, to discover the action of God in the soul, but also to discover God in all things. In order to rebalance the harmful excesses of what he sees as the tyrannical anthropocentrism unconcerned for other creatures, Francis prioritizes what we traditionally call the sacramental principle. <coughs> by underscoring that the multitude of creation is, as he calls it, a continuing revelation of the divine. Such a sacramental approach calls for, in his words, for rejecting every tyranny and every irresponsible domination of human beings over other creatures, since the ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. And this is where uh, post-colonial imagination can meet theology, I propose, most fruitfully and most consequentially in today's context of advancing environmental devastation. Namely, through a vigorous engagement precisely with sacramental modes of theological reflection, as unlikely as it may sound, at least for some post-colonial ears. Such an engagement is not a quirky and endeavor just to explore some academic, previously under-interrogated oddity, but rather something we can do for the life of the world, as Alexander Schmemann would put it. But of course, the post-colonial engagement with all things sacramental can never be naive. And more about that, uh, if you have a, a few spare hours, take a peek at my book. <laughs> We have too little time today to <laughs> dive into that question. Here, suffice it to say that a post-colonial revitalization of sacramentality cannot be an uncritical scramble to grasp onto pre-modern forms of sacramental imagination, rationality, and practice. In post-colonial and decolonial perspectives, what kind of sacramentality is retrieved or renewed and how it is done is of utmost ethical importance. This pivotal post-colonial insight is slowly finding some recognition in mainstream Western eco-theological reflection. For example, in Larry Rasmussen's uh, attention to the differences between what he calls the platonic great chain of being sacramentalism and the web of life sacramental sacramentalism in his book, Earth Honoring Faith. Overall, it seems to me that is, it is never really fruitful to chase after yesterday's sunset by indulging very fierce, very anxious, yet ultimately escapist, or in some cases even crusading, nativist nostalgias for the performances of sacramentality from typically invented golden ages as if nothing had really changed over the past few centuries. So that is not what I am after when I say that a reinvigorated sacramental imaginary is the most prophetic and hopeful resource that the Christian tradition can muster for resisting the great derangement and foster a meaningful transformation. From a post-colonial perspective, what really matters in the context of both the crises of climate change and the crises of reified sacramental rituals of institutionalized religion which more and more people in the West are proverbially leaving behind, is an existentially momentous revitalization of the sacramental imaginary as a whole, as a methodological comportment, as an ontology, and yes, I dare say, as a planetary chamber metaphysics, to use the notion of the Russian postmodernist philosopher Mikhail Epstein. 
obviously, chamber metaphysics, because metaphysics cannot and should not be invoked here in its ahistorical, static, deterministic, or even totalitarian expressions. What is in need of creative revitalization is metaphysics as sacramental imaginary, precisely as imaginary. To use the various key post-colonial ideas, we are talking about a sensibility, a rationality, better yet, a fabric of imagination, a structure of feeling, a certain habitus. In Yap Fulan's expression, I quote, habitus as the constellation of instincts, both individual and collective which shape the ways of feeling, thinking, observing, understanding, approaching, acting, and relating. So this kind of sacramental imaginary is neither exhausted by its historically developed enactments, nor incarcerated in the current forms of institutionalized rights. Unfortunately, in Western sacramental theology, um, as the Eastern Orthodox theologian John Chrysavgis has observed among many other Eastern Orthodox theologians, and I use his expression, the sacraments are often reduced to ritual observances. Of course, rites and rit liturgical embodiments of sacramental mysteries matter. How, when, where, by whom, for whom, through, which images, words, concepts, gestures, postures, and sounds, all such rites and acts of worship are always in need of faithful practice and discerning reformation. I have to say that as a Lutheran. Uh, <laughs> but a post-colonial understanding of sacramental mysteries moves beyond the limited and variously historically contested number of ecclesiastically demarcated ritual observances. So by sacraments, I mean the relational and interactive mysteries engendered by divine self-disclosure and creaturely response that are rooted in and derived from the whole sacramental interface of creation, revelation, and salvation. If you will, they, they are like rhythmic resonances or melodic variations on the paradigmatic sacramental cadence already embedded in the creation and crescendoing in the hypostatic mystery of Christ. The aspiration of post-colonial sacramental imaginary is to enkindle and nurture a non-hegemonic and non-coercive life world of, of transformative interaction among the whole community of planetary creation. Even though sacramentality, sacram sacramentality is a marginal discourse, I think we have to admit that in terms of modernity and even postmodernity, it resiliently glimmers around, above, and under the occlusions, distortions, and all the violent zigzags that crisscross the social, cultural, and political terrains of Christian history. Postcolonial sacramental imaginary is distinctively positioned to reveal and empower those life paths uh, that, that lead to redemptive and vibrant wholeness, which courageously and even prophetically validate and uphold the whole swirling and unfolding planetary web, web of life. It also bears a potential to offer a uniquely effective all-encompassing ontology, or the whole earth thinking, to use the language of Stephanie Kaza and Sam Mickey. So the whole earth imaginary, or in decolonial anthropologists Arturo Escobar's words, the decolonial senti pensar con la tierra, the thinking feeling with the earth, resonates fabulously well, I think, with sacramental modes of thinking being and acting in order to nurture a genuinely interdependent flourishing of the whole community of creation, not just human beings. <coughs> and as such, it provides a substantial rejoinder to the most comprehensive yet often overlooked theological challenge today. That is, to tackle what Elizabeth Johnson has recently called the tyranny of human obsessed spirituality. So that in the face of the threat to the planetary community, she says, we can hope to find a distinctive way of looking at the whole world that will cherish it and will generate resistance to the ecological assault. In short, of primary significance today is a critical retrieval of sacramentality 
and enabling our contemporary perception to once again conceive of a whole sacramental imaginary as a certain planetary chamber metaphysics. That is the deepest challenge for post-colonial sacramental theology. Tinkering with various disparate rites and rituals here and there, be they historical or contemporary, Eastern or Western, medieval, modern or postmodern, traditional or contemporary, in the brick and mortar spaces or in cyberspace, all that is good but will not be sufficient. I can only wish that uh, Western theologians would have heeded Kevin Irvin's invitations to retrieve, as he puts it, sacramentality as a worldview, as a way of looking at life, as a way of thinking and acting in the whole world that values and reveres the world, and as a prism, as a theological lens through which we can view creation and all that is on this good earth as revelations of God's presence and action among us. Kevin Irvin's inspirational words. He further argues that sacramentality shapes a foundational and reflective new paradigm, at least in postmodern theology, in modern theology too, really. So Irvin calls for what is basically a sacramental foundational theology without making it quite so explicit. That's my reading. Uh, namely, in his own words, to, to make creation the ground of theology, both natural and revealed. Post-colonial retrievals, of course, will most likely not be maybe as ironic as some of uh, Kevin Irvin's suggestions, but apply rather the hermeneutics of vigilance while still attentively mining the treasures of the past. My own modest contribution to sacramental inquiry by inserting a post-colonial and diasporic twist can only endorse David Brown's idea that rather than the sacramental being seen as essentially ecclesiastical or somehow narrowly Christian, it should instead be viewed as a major and perhaps even the primary way of exploring God's relationship to our, <clears throat> excuse me, to our world. Again, coming from the post-colonial hermeneutic of vigilance, it is not just any historically dominant version of sacramental ontology that is really worth retrieving and re-envisioning today. The point is to look for and learn from those moments of the tradition that can help us to rediscover a certain ontology of repair in which creation and not the anthropocentric inertia or even patriarchal fixations determine the axis of truth beauty, and power, but indeed the creation itself takes the central stage. What is worth retrieving, perhaps reaching out toward would be a more accurate term considering the scope of such re-envisioning that is really involved here, is precisely a metaphysics which articulates a holistic yet non-totalitarian vision of the dynamic, evolving, and open-ended interrelatedness, interdependence, and interaccountability for all planetary life forms as they seek and find the deeply incarnate God in all their crevices, in all their cracks and crannies, and also somehow mystically, almost incomprehensibly, find themselves in God. So this is where the post-colonial turn to planetarity comes to the fore to join hands with sacramental reflection. In this context, uh, Paul Gilroy has called for a new planetary consciousness. Because now in post-colonial thought, we can say that the planet itself is very often viewed as a subaltern entity, not, not just populated by certain subalternized peoples. When perceived through the prism of plan planetary consciousness, Gilroy writes, the world becomes not a limitless globe, but a small, fragile, and finite place one planet among others with strictly limited resources that are allocated unequally. Gilroy insists on keeping the ecological and socio-political aspects of life closely intertwined as we search for a new post-colonial relationship with the non-human world. Planetary consciousness, according to Gilroy, is a consciousness, and I quote, of the tragedy, fragility, and brevity of indivisible human existence that is all the more valuable as a result of its openness to the damage done by racism. 
But planetary consciousness supports an appreciation of nature as a common condition of our imperiled existence, resistant to commodification. Of course, uh, one could not do uh, any talk on post-colonial thought or theology or philosophy without somehow talking about Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. And if I read her correctly, um, if I read her correctly, it seems to me that she has advocated the notion of planetarity, an alternative imaginary to the globalized world, which remains spitefully structured and in neo-colonial dominance, and in exploitative competition. The term to planetarity conveys substantial self-criticism within post-colonial studies, since the imaginary of planetarity really disrupts the habitual anthropocentrism of post-colonial analysis, plain and simple. It situates all of them within a transcendence, which in itself is an immensely interrelated and interdependent complexity, surrounding and conditioning all forms of our life. So in this perspective, planetarity is the transcendent meta context of life. As Spivak argues, and I quote, the planet is in the species of alterity, belonging to another system, and yet we inhabit it on loan. She highlights the urgency of the turn to planet by calling for a post-colonial self-scrutiny, by saying to globalize is to think a manageable world. To think of ourselves as planetary is to remember that if we live a hundred years, even a devastated planet lives a billion without us. So realizing that we are planetary creatures also means the recognition of our planet, uh, our planet's alterity, that remains underived from us. And very importantly, she emphasizes it is not our dialectical negation. Spivak insists that post-colonialism must not remain caught in the analysis of mere naturalism over nationalism uh, over colonialism because today it is planetarity that we are called to imagine since we are dealing with heterogeneity on a different scale and related to imperialisms on another model. Moreover, moving into theology now, post-colonial theologian Myra Rivera confirms that ecological crisis is a fundamental concern for post-colonial criticism, one that reveals the breadth and depth of destruction caused by human practices promoted by today's empires. Rivera rightly insists that an earthy post-colonial theology must be fully aware of its vocation and its mission as an ecologically committed theopolitics. It is urged to discover the inextricable con connections between political, theological, and ecological, deepening its reading strategies and critiques of empire to denounce the mutilation of the elemental bonds of our world and attuning itself to traditions of reverence towards fire, water, air, and earth. We really can't speak about a full-fledged post-colonial eco-theology yet. But at, as the post-colonial theologian Susan Abraham has pointed out more recently, planetarity is a peculiar mindset that challenges the exploitative dualisms of colonial and post-colonial power. And in that sense, it does resonate uh, quite well here. And this is precisely where a genuinely fruitful conversation between post-colonialism and sacramental theology can materialize. One of the most promising avenues to explore the fundamental building blocks of sacramental imaginary beyond anthropocentric and androcentric and also ecclesiocentric sacramental systems is the conception of the earth and indeed the whole cosmos as a primordial, original, or primary sacrament. Or, or I prefer to say by poaching a term from theologians like Otto Zemmelroth or, or Karl Rahner, as the Ur sacrament. Now to talk about the world as a sacrament might sound to some of you like really old news. Those of you who are familiar with the Eastern Orthodox tradition for sure will remember that, for example, uh, Alexander Schmemann already talked about it in the 1960s, and he's not the only one. More recently, um, across a whole denominational spectrum, Theologians as diverse as, as Leonardo Boff and Elizabeth Jensen, Arthur Peacock, uh, Thomas Berry, and Larry Rasmussen 
employ this imagery of the world as a sacrament. What is new in this conception of the planet as the Ur sacrament? The prefix Ur here denoting the temporal and material precedents, the primeval deep history of the earth, which renders the whole sacramental pluriverse possible and open for business, so to say. This is what we are talking about here. With this imagination, we are going beyond what I call the sacramental number games, be they 150, 45, seven or two, or at least seven or whatever the number, and turning rather to a perception of the earth as the primeval grounding mystery of created life. So the planetary turn in sacramental theology entails a certain counter move, if you will, vis-a-vis -vis the historical flattening and narrowing of the sacramental galaxy from the Middle Ages onward, that many, again from uh, Alexander Schmemann to the Jewish uh, critic uh, Regina Mara Schwartz and many in between, have lamented as part of the mo modern Western disenchantment. Of course, post-colonial sacramental thinkers join in this lament, but they also highlight the compartmentalization and institu institutionalization of the sacramental imaginary. Well, these words are even hard to say, but I guess that just kind of captures what is going on here. Um, into these very contentious numbers games. And historically, we have quite an experience of, of strife, disagreement, uh, and vehement disagreement indeed. Uh, precisely as an arena of ever more complex ecclesiastical power games, and that is the issue for the post-colonial critique, and of course entanglements with patriarchy and empire. Meanwhile, the constructive momentum of post-colonial planetarity dialogues with the trailblazing ideas of such theologians here in the West as Theodore, <coughs> excuse me, Theodore Runyon, uh, Elizabeth Jansen, Dorothy McDougall, and also a Jesuit theologian from India, Francis de Sa. Let me mention briefly just the most salient points in this trajectory of theological creativity. I hope that those of you who might be interested uh, in exploring these ideas in more depth will consider reading their works. Those are really, really fascinating, and I have in my book a just a summary, but much more extensive one than I can ever provide here. So here I have to limit one more thing to just one sentence here, namely that to consider the planet as the Ur sacrament does not necessarily, indeed not at all, require one to marginalize Jesus Christ, the word and wisdom incarnate, as some may worry. But that conversation uh, will need to be left for another time. So back to Earth, <laughs> back to the <laughs> as Ur sacrament. Let's start with the amazing Methodist theologian Theodore Runyon. He has pointed out that often the church has been unaware or maybe even forgetful of the cosmic implications of the sacraments. It has resulted, in his words, in a timid, truncated, narrowly ecclesiastical understanding that has lost the keys to the kingdom and its world-transforming power. An alternative, Runyon suggests, is to look at the whole creation in a distinctly sacramental way and notice, I quote, in the hands in the, of the creator, the world itself serves as the first sacrament, the first and most basic use of the material to communicate and facilitate the divine human relationship. So hence, for Runyon, the world, the earth, is the most fundamental sacramental phenomenon, as he puts it, in which all of the particular sacraments are rooted. The earth, he proposes, is the original sign of God's grace, and thus the original sacrament. And this already starts to decenter the anthropocentric fixations of salvation, as well as corrects the narcissistic temptation of the church to be fascinated and preoccupied by its own institutional life, as Ryan observes. Meanwhile, the Roman Catholic Elizabeth Johnson has been calling for a turn to the cosmos for quite some time. 
She proposes a whole new methodological horizon in which the created world is seen as, I quote, primordial sacrament that reflects the glory of God and that speaks a revelatory word. She also argues for understanding the created reality as a cosmic pneumatological communio sanctorum. For Johnson, as the creation journeys toward the salvific union with God, it does so not just through some ultimately disposable and wasteful warp of space and time, but instead sacramentally. Meaning that for the universe itself, it is the primordial sacrament through which we participate in and communicate with the divine mystery. We have to gallop forward. Another Roman Catholic, Dorothy McDougall, takes on the anthropocentric and androcentric turn to the subject in modern and postmodern sacramental theology by calling out the continued investment in dualistic and patriarchal ontologies. The crises of climate change, uh, she says, mandates a far-reaching scrutiny of the anthropocentrism that is inherent in the ex exclusive attention to human history that is endemic in sacramental theology, she writes. McDougall argues for the shifting of precedence, not exclusivity or dominance, to the cosmos as the primary in event in which humanity is drawn into and participates in God's creative, redeeming love. Relating to cosmos as the primary sacrament, I quote, recognizes the contingency of all cultural narratives and precludes an approach that limits divine involvement in the world to humanity or to its Christian ecclesial expression. In specifically Eucharistic context, McDougall writes, the cosmos as primary sacrament affirms that the Paschal mystery is embedded in the earth's struggle towards life and that the divine promise is revealed in the beauty and fecund aliveness of the universe itself. And finally, we turn to India. Uh, a voice from the post-colonial India, the Jesuit theologian Francis de Sa. De Sa suggests that the created reality is a sacramentum mundi, and of course, the Roman Catholics among you will be very fam familiar with that concept. Um, so, uh, in the sense of being the primordial sacrament or ur sacrament. Cosmos, the whole universe indeed, uh, as the primordial sacrament is the foundation of all sacramental imagination and action, since uh, the Sa writes, the world alone is the sacrament of reality, since it is the place where humans can encounter one another as well as the divine. Ultimately, he says, all sacraments are grounded in the one and only sacrament of reality, namely the world. So what are the post-colonial implications of these captivating sacramental explorations? Perceiving the planet and indeed the cosmos as sacramentally primary, primordial, original, first, as ur sacrament, whichever term you prefer, is to reconceive and rebalance the horizons of creation and salvation away from the tyranny of anthropocentrism and androcentrism. That is the big issue here. In post-colonial parlance, what the idea of the world as the primordial sacrament critiques and modulates is precisely that imperialistic subalternization of non-human creation and the jealously dualistic cosmology which post-colonial critical metaphors, such as planetarity, are also trying to challenge. Namely, they try to undermine and transmute the hegemonic cosmologies of power and dominance, which inscribe their cruel zero-sum logic into every nook and cranny of human relationships and into the very texture of creation. The exploration of the world as Ur Sacrament focuses on the re-envisioning of the wholeness of reality for all, for humanity as well as for the rest of the planetary community of creation. It goes hand in hand with the emphasis on sacramentality as ethics as well, through transformative liberation and planetary solidarity. As for sacraments themselves, I love how Francis de Sa puts it so poignantly, arguing that precisely that sacraments are precisely all those events, all those interactions and situations that function as a liberative symbol 
in the experience of a people. So the sacramental dynamic is the liberative dynamic, according to the South. Such an imaginary of planetary sacramentality, starting with the cosmos at, as the ur sacrament, embody the potential to derail and then reroute the edifices of dominance, including patriarchal, ecclesiastical dominance, as well as the wholesale anthropocentric dominance. Instead of being just one more ritualized realm of hegemonic power games and effective subalternization of the natural world or women or indigenous peoples or the poor, you name it, or all of them together, this sacramental imaginary of divine power functions, as the Sa puts it, in an operative presence of the divine mystery in all things and at all times. Now, what about the post-colonial imaginary of planetary sacramentality and the idea of sacramental pluriverse? I have to say a few things uh, before we are done here about that too. So to talk about the sacramental pluriverse is to talk about an open, dynamic, and continually emerging sacramental system, if system is really a good word for this at all. It cannot be restrained by numerically closed sacramental systems, even as such systems currently coexist in an empirical pluriverse of partial agreements and disagreements among Christian traditions and denominations. We all are quite well aware of that. Yet at a deeper level, sacramental, sacramentality names a transontological borderscape through which the uncreated encounters the created through a pluriverse of refractions, the sacraments, the sacramental mysteries, to revitalize, to liberate, to reconcile, to redeem, and to make creation whole in the thick of a messy historical development in an exhaustible multitude of ways and places. These sacramental re refractions, to reiterate, are relational, interactive, embodied, polyvalent, hybrid, multi-mediated, multi-directional actions, occasions, <coughs> happenings, proceeding situations, indeed you name it. They are these interactive mysteries. They are not limited to uh, or exhausted by rituals, concepts, and images that have sometimes in the past been hijacked to uh, or have tamely surrendered to the pathologies of imperial power, past and present. All things considered, as Aloysius Pierce puts it in a very eloquent way, sacraments are not the remote control apparatus of a clerical caste, whatever else they, they are. So let's go back to pluriverse. A, a decolonial image, really, this comes from the decolonial uh, discourse, a decolonial image of relational difference. It is, as it were, a world in which many worlds fit. In, in a different life worlds and life paths coexist in a more or less convivial and always radically relational way. It is a multipolar and polyvocal reality. It is marked by the omnidirectional, though not always and not necessarily symmetrical, relationships of reciprocity and interdependence. It is using a more traditional theological lingo as a vibrant labyrinth of analogical resonances. Or in the words of anthropologist Arturo Escobar again, pluriverse, he says, is fractal or endowed with self-similarity anywhere you look at any scale, you find similar, yet not the same, configurations, meshes, assemblages. So the post-colonial pluriverse is like a roomy galaxy, if you will, with many-fold borderlands. It is lively, earthy, fleshy, messy, polyphonic, and eschatologically open-ended. It is a web of interconnected fractal patterns signifying, mediating, and affecting divine grace in history, and now it is not a sheer chaos. Why? Because the cipher of this sacramental pluriverse is Christ himself. Christ is its paradigmatic wellspring. Christ is the word and the wisdom incarnate in whom all things are created and who became the sacramental crescendo of incarnate divine life, becoming flesh for us for our salvation and for the 
life of the world. Indeed, indwelling into the deepest material tissues of creation. So the post-colonial post -colonial sacramental pluriverse transcends the historically contingent and culturally circumscribed genealogies of sacramental number games. Such games can never, theologically speaking, engender any binding regulatory authority anyway over the creative and transgressive limitlessness with which the spirit brooded in, with, over, under, and throughout the origins and depths of creation. Because the spirit is always inbound, so to say, toward us, yet the spirit is also unbound in a manner most interiorly akin to breath and in a manner most exteriorly akin to wind. The sacramental pluriverse percolates throughout the creation which itself is like an unfinished symphony. The multiple sacramental melodies play off one another and constantly weave in and out of this incredibly multifarious cosmic fugue of visible and invisible realities, meta-realities, energies. In this world, which is always a work in progress, sacramental me melodies often reverberate, admittedly, as if through a veil of static noise, as if slightly out of tune. And yet within and throughout all these painful fissures of this unfinished symphony, our world, the sacramental pluriverse stealthily scores its rhythms and melodies into our life worlds to invite us, various kinds of creatures, into the raw and intimate borderland where the triune mystery of life which underlies all that is, is tirelessly migrating toward us and where we, creatures, can be empowered to embark on our own holy migration into the divine life. Perhaps a musical analogy might be somewhat helpful here. This kind of pluriverse can be perceived as resonant in three rhythms and obviously very, very many melodies. I would like to briefly just mention some improvising articulations of it here. Obviously, that's not the only way how one can look at that. Uh, the first rhythm is that of sacraments of creation. The earth and our cosmos is our ursacrament of the divine fiat. It is the irreducible and irrevocable planetary context of our existence. It is underived from us and it predates us, hence the prefix ur. Within this Ur sacrament emerges a whole web of sacraments of creation, like marriages, like funerals, like friendships, like so many culturally specific rites of passage that may fit into this inclusive rhythm of creation. The second rhythm is that of the sacraments of salvation. Of course, Christ is the paradigmatic sacrament here, this proleptic crescendo, if you will, of this sacramental existence. Here also belongs the Eucharist, the profoundest mystery of salvific transformation, the mystical body of Christ. And of course, mystical is not to be competitively or dialectically juxtaposed to true, real, political, or ethical body of Christ. I think this simplification must be resisted as vigorously as possible. Here also belongs baptism as the sacramental melody of awakening, initiation, and new beginning in the communion with God. Scripture could be understood as a sacramental melody that resounds ever anew as it stirs and nourishes truthful di discipleship and challenges it to grow ever deeper. Preaching the gospel is a sacramental melody that rejuvenates the life of the spirit and constantly attunes it to the dangerous me memory, as Johann Baptist Metz would say, of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. The third rhythm, rhythm is that of the sacramental melodies of discipleship. Reconciliation as well as various traditions of anointing can be conceived among the sacramental melodies of healing and renewal. Sustained spiritual practices, spiritual direction can be seen as sacramental melodies of spiritual maturation that require courageous and quite often countercultural and very effortful ascetic perseverance or body and mind over long periods of time. Sacraments of time and place, celebration of Sunday, daily office, pilgrimages, to name just a few, are among the melodies in this rhythm. 
Of course, there are also ordinations, professions of vows, and various other occasions that mark dedicated commitments to discipleship that manifest in faithful and prophetic action inside and outside of the communities of faith. Each sacramental melody, of course, has its own pitch and timbre. Indeed, some sacramental mysteries are greater and some are lesser, to borrow, again, the orthodox parlance. Yet, each sacramental melody can, has been, and is being modulated inescapably from culture to culture, from historical era to historical era. Most importantly, if we take seriously the primeval planetary reality of Ur sacrament, all and every single sacramental action and interaction needs to be doggedly hyper-attentive towards the ways we, as human beings, engage in sacramental commerce with a whole host of non-human players that render possible sacramentality as such. For, for any sacrament to be a sacrament, matter matters, bodies matter, tissues and molecules matter, our commonly shared stardust matters. Just yesterday, I prayed with many other humans and our pets and all the creatures in the trees and in the grass at a joint Lutheran and Episcopalian blessing of the animals service in Cincinnati for the integrity, restoration, and well-being of the whole circle of life, to use the language of that liturgy. If there's any meaning at all to the words such as, in the rustling grass I hear God pass, as we sang yesterday, then matter indeed matters. It matters more painstakingly and with more theological gravitas than most of us humans previously realized. Finally, to sum it all up, evidently there are multiple ways of perceiving, performing, and envisioning sacramentality. What is particularly relevant from a post-colonial point of view is that this contrapuntal pluriverse of sacramentality is an open, dynamic, convivial, reciprocal, and non-hegemonic life world. It challenges the doctrinal inertia of scarcity that measures out sacramental grace in rigidly controlled doses. Post-colonial sacramental pluriverse pursues a different acoustics of imagination. It seeks to move spiritually, epistemologically, doctrinally, pastorally, culturally, aesthetically, and institutionally beyond the power games of imperial orthodoxy, which, as history shows us only too often, can stifle the life of the spirit and mutilate bodies and souls by giving in to racist hierarchies, institutional hegemony, cultural colonialism, and patriarchal disempowerment. Post-colonial sacramental imaginaries cannot find refuge or inspiration in a nostalgic mimicry of the past, particularly the imperial and colonial past and its pathologies of power, which are woven far more deeply into the historical texture of the Christian tradition than many Christians are still ready to recognize. In the, instead, the goal of post-colonially revitalized sacramental imaginary is vectored toward an intentional kenosis of tyranny and hegemony. It is not about churchiness or nostalgic piety. It is instead about the audacity to seek, sense, taste, find, share, and convey the holy mystery that underlies all that exists in all that exists, from intergalactic vastness of space to the least of the wretched of the earth, and now the suffering earth itself, our common and our creaturely home. Until and unless there is a willingness and readiness to seek and embody the sacramental signature of the divine in all created things, as a planetary imaginary, mere adjustments of liturgy, rituals, liturgical language here and there alone will not, I'm afraid, effectively address the planetary crises of both natural environments and social justice. Nor will it wondrously undo the growing disenchantment with, co with conventional sacramental expressions in our decreasing, dwindling Western Christian communities. So what remains to consider is committing to a planetary turn precisely as a metaphysical turn in theology, in spirituality, in worship, in institutional cultures, 
in post-colonial and many other arenas of knowledge, inquiry, and creativity. Our imaginaries of God, of world, of ourselves, and of our non-human fellow pilgrims on this earth, earth, however shaped these imaginaries are, and there are multiple ways of doing that, they all function for good or for ill. They matter. They make an impact. At the time when we need to look at the great derangement and look at it by looking squarely in its face, I believe that as far as method in theology or the signature of all things is concerned, it is worth going sacramental in a fortissimo mode, but of course with a post-colonial twist. Thank you. <laughs>